So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ariana Baldwin. I am the Senior Coordinator of Outreach and Partnerships at Grow Brooklyn. And before we get started, I really, really, really just want to take the time to thank every single one of you for taking time out of your busy schedules and your evening to join us for this community education uh, tonight. All of us on this call believe that a well-informed, a properly equipped, and an educated community is a community that will prosper, but sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to you know, find room for that prosperity when you don't have the resources that you need in order to, you know, make way for that prosperity and space for that. And we all know that tax season in the United States can be a stressful, complicated, and confusing time for many of us and for many different reasons. But one of the biggest reasons is because there's a lot of information out there that you need to know surrounding taxes, like deadlines, rules, regulations, requirements, um, and all these different things. And it can be overwhelming to feel like you need to know all of that because if you don't, you could get in trouble with the IRS or you'll have to fear the wrath of the IRS, um, this scary entity that nobody wants to deal with that they don't have to. Um, and we think that if you have the information that you need, it can actually be a stress-free, worry-free, and maybe even peaceful or pleasant process, a simple process. Um, but this confusion and this sense of overwhelmingness leads community members, as well as those of us who are in this field, to even wonder if filing your taxes is something that you're supposed to do every year, then why is it made to be so confusing and you know difficult? And that's exactly why Grow Brooklyn and Brooklyn Legal Corporation A partnered together to put together this event, the Need to Know Series uh, 2022 tax season. So together we've made it our goal to break down and simplify all the most important tax information that we believe that you need to know to have that worry-free, stress-free, uncomplicated, and maybe peaceful tax season. Um, so over the course of three weeks, beginning two weeks ago and coming to an end tonight, our group of tax attorneys and experienced tax professionals have covered six of the nine topics that you see here in that yellow box, with two topics being covered each night, as well as um, an opportunity for the community to ask any questions that they may have, because how often is it that you have tax attorneys and experienced tax professionals you know, at your disposal to ask um, whatever questions you may have? It's not very often. Um, so in case you can't read that box, if it's a little bit too small, we've covered filing requirements, important deadlines, information on various tax credits and deductions, eligibility for the IRS's um, Low Income Taxpayer Clinic, or LITC for short, and the IRS Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, or VITA for short. The services provided by these programs, as well as information for target of abuse clients who are um, claiming dependents this tax season. And tonight, we'll bring it to a close by offering you all information on worker classifications and self-employment obligations, as well as the very, very important taxpayer bill of rights. Um, so being that BK Legal and Grow Brooklyn are proud to have their roots in Brooklyn, even though we serve the greater population of New York City, we're especially proud to have the support of the three Brooklyn-based elected officials that you see at the bottom of the flyer. Two weeks ago to kick off part one, we had the absolute pleasure of welcoming New York State Senate, um, New York State Senator, excuse me, Boxan Prasad, who represents New York's 19th Senatorial District, which consists of Southeast Brooklyn and parts of Queens. Last week for part two, we were thrilled and pleased to be joined by a representative um, from, uh, excuse me, a representative from the 35th Council District, um, Council Member Crystal Hudson, and that district comprised, is comprised of Central Brooklyn, parts of Central Brooklyn, and parts of Northwest Brooklyn. And tonight, last but certainly not least, it is our absolute pleasure and honor, and we're immensely grateful to have the support and to be joined by New York State Assemblywoman Farah Soufran Forrest, who represents New York's 57th Assembly District, which consists of parts of Northwest Brooklyn. Um, so Assemblywoman, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for showing up for the community as you always do. We really appreciate you. And without further ado, I wanna pass it over to you to share any words or insights that you have for the community tonight. Well, thank you so much, Ariana, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for showing up tonight. Um, this is all about you, you the star. Um, my name is Ferris Supraat Forrest, and I'm the assembly member for uh, Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Bed-Stuy, and Crown Heights. And I'm so glad that Grow Brooklyn um, has brought us together tonight and talk about the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, self-employment obligations, and of course, workers' classification. I'm up in Albany right now, even though you see my little background on Eastern Parkway. Um, 
because it is budget season, state budget season. And one of my top priority is making sure that the wealthy pay their fair share in taxes so that regular people like us don't have to struggle. And I'm not just talking about billionaires. I'm talking about the millionaires and a couple of thousandaires too. And let me tell you, it's pretty easy for wealthy people and big corporations to get away with not paying their taxes. I mean, look at Bill, what's his name? Donald Trump. But it's so much harder for regular people. Um, even though we pay less, you know, the IRS knows that we don't have fancy lawyers to protect us. And sometimes it's kind of predatory, to be honest. So that's why it's important for you to know your rights when dealing with the IRS and ask the expert from Grow Brooklyn if you have any questions. Please, please, please do not stay silent. If you need help, please contact your representatives, even if you don't live in my um, um, district, um, not only for Grow NYC, but in general, we need you to show up and show out because people in Albany need to know that you support raising taxes on the richest because Bill Gates, uh, what's his name, the Amazon guy, they need to pay up so that me and you can have some social services. So now that you know that my district and in Brooklyn, we're, we're, you know that we're home to a lot of Black and immigrant-owned businesses as well. And maybe some business owners are here tonight. I hope so because our tax systems in this country can be especially opaque and challenging for the people who don't have access to power. So I really believe in the community education and political education to make sure these systems are more accessible and create opportunities for black immigrant businesses to thrive in Brooklyn. And um, I wanted you to know that my office will be hosting two free tax prep days in partnership with Grow Brooklyn. Uh, the first one is on Monday, March 13th, and on Thursday, March 23rd. On those days, you can come by my district office at 55 Hanson Place, and the tax prep experts will help you file your taxes for free. Please take advantage of this information, this resource, and spread the word. Don't be like me, okay? And wait till May 16th to submit the taxes. Don't do that. You risk getting in trouble. So you can always call the office for help with other issues like landlord harassment or accessing benefits. You know, the office is here for you. So you can reach us at 718, and I'm going to drop it in the you know, chat, but 718-596-0100. And my staff, along with Grow NYC, will be happy to help you. Y'all have a pleasant evening. And again, you know, knowledge is power. So stay powerful, people. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Knowledge is power and education and liberation, they go hand in hand. So how do you get liberated? Through education. Um, thank you so much, Assemblywoman, for your words. We really appreciate it. We appreciate all the work that you do up in Albany, as well as all the work that you do down here in the district in Brooklyn. We really, really appreciate you. And we thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, so I do also want to take this space to acknowledge our speakers, our amazing speakers that we have here for you tonight. We have the pleasure of welcoming Danny Washington from Grow Brooklyn, who will be covering worker classifications and self-employment obligations. And Kelly Lay from CK Legal, who will be covering the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Um, we're just about ready to get started, I promise. But we're going to uh, a little bit just talk about the other services that Go Brooklyn provides, as well as the other services that um, CK Legal provides. So Go Brooklyn is a Brooklyn-based nonprofit that, like I said before, serves the greater population of New York City, with our mission being to enable individuals and families to secure their economic futures. And we fulfill that uh, mission by helping them grow and protect their assets and by providing free tax prep, pro bono and low cost legal services, as well as financial and housing, excuse me, counseling. So our foreclosure prevention program offers free counseling to help our community members hold on to their homes if they are facing foreclosure. Um, we have attorneys who can represent you at settlement conferences and negotiate as, uh, like a resolution as well. 
and we have counselors who will negotiate for you, talk to your lenders, and give you budgeting and documentation advice. Our Protect Your Treasure program, as we affectionately call the PYT program, offers pro bono, end of life, and estate planning legal services. And this includes assistance with surrogates court, as well as the preparation and execution of estate planning legal documents. So that includes a living will, uh, last will and testament, healthcare proxy, power of attorney, and other advanced directives. And this year, Grow Brooklyn is one of five, is very proud to be, one of five partners on the Center for New York City Neighborhoods Black Home Ownership Project, Generation to Generation Estate Planning. Uh, the title is quite a mouthful. But there's this, um, the program, essentially the goal is, what we're doing is offering uh, free estate planning legal services to black homeowners in Central Brooklyn, South Brooklyn, and the North Bronx, with the goal being to ensure black homeowners in our city are able to stay in the city and keep their homes in the city and put them in a position where they're able to pass down those homes to their family and thus, you know, accruing and creating and growing and protecting generational wealth. Uh, additionally, as a HUD certified organization, our financial capabilities program offers free one-on-one -on -one financial counseling for anyone, but specifically for homeowners who are looking to work towards specific goals in the homeowning or home buying process. So that includes creating a sustainable budget, building and repairing your credit score, establishing savings over time, all just to prepare individuals and families to be able to navigate and use an accessible home buying process. And finally, we have our free tax prep program, which I'm not gonna get into right now because we're going to cover it later in the presentation. But with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Kelly and she's gonna to talk to you a little bit more about the services that BK Legal provides. Thanks, Ariana. And good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the last part of our three-part series. And special thanks again to New York State Assemblywoman, Ferris of Front Force for sponsoring this and for everyone at Grow Brooklyn for making this event possible. Uh, my name is Kelly Lai. I'm a staff attorney and a certified public accountant at Brooklyn Legal Services Corp Bays, specifically the Consumer Economic Advocacy Program. So at BKA CEA program, we prevent foreclosures and defend against predatory lending. We also have the Low Income Taxpayer Clinic we help resolve any tax issues such as tax debt, innocent spouse relief, help recovering unpaid refunds and stimulus checks. We also have two other units. Uh, first one, preserving affordable housing where we represent tenants facing eviction or their landlords violating fair housing law. And then that, last but not least, our community economic development program. We provide legal counsel to nonprofits and small businesses in the community. We also help negotiate rent and arrears for those specific businesses. Uh, we will leave questions at the very end, but I will be passing this back to Danny Washington from Grow Brooklyn. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you, Assemblywoman, for your time and your effort. Uh, my name is Danny Washington, and I'm with uh, Grow Brooklyn. I'm part of the self-employed tax program coordinator here at Grow Brooklyn. It is a it is an, it is a program that just launched this year and pretty much our program is geared to freelancers, self-employed and small businesses that need uh, some tax some help in following their taxes and tax preparation and tax planning as well. Uh, so my role here at Grow Brooklyn is to make sure ensure that the community is well served with and make sure the small business community is actually well served. And I've been involved with self in small business before I got on board with Grow Brooklyn with the Port Authority of New York, where I was a certification manager with the MWBE program, which is the Minority Women Business Owned Enterprise. So I was a certification agent. So I'm pretty much familiar with the small business aspect of the community and, and what they what their needs are. And throughout the year, throughout the year, we're going to perform workshops where and have joint partnerships with other organizations that will assist small businesses that will help them grow in their marketing and bookkeeping and accounting services, as well as tax preparation. So I'm going to get started with the self-employment ob obligations of 
small businesses that in our community as far as tax planning and taxes. So we're gonna just go ahead and get started on that on the next slide. All right, so many of you already have a small business or begin or thinking about or start or have started a small business or thinking about starting a small business. Just it, it is very exciting. You are your own boss. I've done it years, many, many moons ago, and it was a very exciting process. Um, the process is sometimes some, some people start their businesses during while they're working a W-2 job, which is fine. The IRS will never penalize you for that, for having a side, well, a side business while you're working a W-2 job. I think that's very beneficial to most people to maintain their living standards while working on their dream of becoming self-sufficient and self-employed. But that's where the trick, that's where the aspects come in, where the business become, where the lines of becoming a business, where your business is a hobby. And the IRS defines it. If you're a hobby, as a hobby, if you have losses in your business for more than three to five years, three out of the five years while you're in existence, because some, some individuals will start a business just to have losses to offset their W-2 income which is somewhat fine, but the IRS, that's a red flag point on it. And, and, the term, and actually restructure that business and reclassify that business as a hobby. What that means, what does that mean? That just means that as a hobby, all your, all your expenses are disallowed and they're only gonna pick up and the IRS will only allow the, 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 your income you're going to be taxed on solely just your income instead of your expenses. So that's why it's very important to actually, when you form your business, you have to have a plan, a business plan, a business plan that outlines what your structure, what, what the structure of your business is, whether you're going to start off as a sole proprietorship or you're going to form what is called a limited liability corporation, an LLC, or a corporation, or S corporation, or C corporation. That's one of those four different structures that you can you have the you have the options of using when you're forming your business, and as well as having a business plan, you also have to have a bookkeeping system in place. For instance, you can have QuickBooks. There's a free program called Wave where you can just do your books for free. Where it's a free program it started. Uh, I think it was uh, started by Google. Um, you can register. Do your book, upload, connect your business bank accounts, or connect all your bank accounts and your credit card accounts, and you can just start recording your transactions. That way, at the end of the year, you will have what is called an, a profit and loss statement, which is an income statement. So when you have your income statement, bring in your income statement, I'll be able to be able to prepare your return for you and also give you some advice on how to plan for next year. Um, let's talk about the business assets. Sometimes you, you need equipment, your own equipment, which is allowable, which is an allowable expense. And when you purchase your equipment, the beauty of it is that you can take depreciation over a five to seven year period on depending on the classification of the asset. So, and Sometimes you can also call, you can take an expense, the whole asset, which using the whole section 179 deduction, where in that year, in that same year, you can take the entire deduction of your business asset for that year. That's where I come in as your as as the community advisor on self-employment taxes, because I can also direct you which expenses are deductible and which are not, which are not allowed. So that's why a consultation is very important. And that's why this is very this is a very important program to educate our community on how to actually run a business. And knowing that taxes are very is very vital into in tax planning is very vital in the growth of the business of your business and being self-employed. Next slide. 
Oh, let me just go ahead and talk about the self-employment tax. Go back. I'm sorry. Um, at the end of the year, when you file your when you when you're ready to file your return on your profit, if you are if you are profitable, that profit is subject to not only state, not only federal, state, and local taxes, but it is also subject to a self-employment tax. Now, self-employment tax, what it is, is that 12.4% of your profit is subject to Social Security and Medicare taxes. Because you are self-employed, there's no employer that will do the withholding. So you are, you definitely are responsible for side enough funds for, to pay your taxes at the end of the year. Now, the IRS allows you to do what is called estimated tax payments throughout the year. For instance, every quarter, beginning in April 15th to June 15th to October 15th, and the following year, January 15th, those are the four important dates where you can submit an estimate, estimate of your total profit of all the total income that you receive during the year, during the course of the year. And at Grow Brooklyn, we can assist you on planning for those planning to planning for your estimated tax for that for those four important quarters. Okay, next slide. Now, as I mentioned before, do you truly have a business? I went over the, the aspects of your business being a, being a true business versus a hobby. Now, I'm just gonna reiterate that the IRS has a list of factors determining whether your pastime is more than your business. And the IRS says, states that do you carry a business activity like in a business like that, meaning that there is a profit motive for you, for you to start the business. That means you have to actively make a profit. That's, that's the whole purpose of you being self-employed. As I mentioned before, individuals start businesses just to take losses against their other end, which is somewhat allowable for the first three years, but then you're just gonna be, it's just gonna be reclassified as a hobby. It also, the IRS also takes into factor the time that you put into the business. What, what are you doing the marketing? Are you doing the sales? Are you doing phone calls throughout the day? Are, are you actually trying to actually make a profit for this, for your venture? Also, do you depend on the income activity for your livelihood? The IRS does look at that, that you spend 12 hours a day and 12 to maybe even 15 hours a day being self-employed, working on your business. And they, the IRS will look at that this, and it will show that, yeah, this is legitimately a business. And if you are so, and if you are incurring losses, which is not uncommon, the IRS also factor also is very forgiving because most businesses do not generate a profit until after the third year. So you're pretty much you're just going to be working for you. You really are just going to be working for yourself. From the startup phase to the to the third to the third year of your venture. All right, next slide, please. Okay. All right, next slide. I think we went over that. Next slide. All right, and as I mentioned before, if you're self-employed, if you're sole proprietor. All your business, all your business income and your losses are going to be recorded, recorded on what's called a Schedule C. Now, the Schedule C is just going to be filed with your 1040 form. At the end. And at the end of the year, that's going to report your total income for or losses for that year regarding your business. And it's pretty much simple. They'll calculate all the taxes, the federal and local, state and local taxes, as well as the self-employment taxes, as I mentioned before. Next slide. All right, so now we're gonna get into worker classifications, which is very important to understand. Um, 
you it's very understand you should understand that an employee is generally considered someone that performs services for the business who has business control of what will be done. And what that really means that when you everybody has a nine to five, you come in, the employer, when you get onboarded with a as a not as a W-2 employee, you get on, onboarded. You have to fill out what's called a W-4 form, which it means that they're going to do the with your employer is going to take care of all your withholdings, your federal, state, and local withholdings, as well as your Social Security withholdings and Medicare, withholdings, which is going to be reported on your W-2 every year. Um, and, it, and also the business, your employer controls what what services are performed during throughout the day. So they have ultimate control over you over you during the time that you're working within that business. All right, they control what time you come in, what time you, you have breaks, what time you go to lunch, and what time you leave. They also even control if, whether or not you stay over for all overtime. Now, as an independent contractor, there's usually a person that's, that's operating as in a trade or business or a profession to offer services to the public, meaning you're free to work your own hours, you, ha well, you have expenses that you can record on your, what is called your schedule C on your business return. And also you have control over how much income that you make throughout the year. Next slide. Now, whether a worker is independent is an independent contractor or an employee, depend, like I mentioned before, be, depends on the relationship between the worker and the business. Now, there are three categories to consider, the, which is the relationship with the parties, the behavior control, and the financial control. Let's start with the relationship of the parties. Now, as an independent contractor, there's usually going to be written contracts. There's usually going to be invoices that's going to be sent to the contract or the can't contract the. Um, there is no need to come in at a set hour because within the parameters of that contract, uh, the relationship between the contractor and the contract fee, they just have to have they have to complete the project within a certain amount of time. And there is no need, they can complete the, the contractor can complete it at any time. And to, in order to maintain the relationship with the part with the contract, the crop, excuse me, the contract, as opposed to an employer or, or an employee, they have no the employer has control over the aspects of the employee, whether they come in, whether they where uh, they control uh, the withholdings, they also control they have also employee benefits which. Independent contractors are not responsible. They are only responsible for their own taxes as well, their own per employee benefits as well as all aspects of the the independent contractor has control over their income, their employee benefits, and their expenses. Whereas the employer, the employee doesn't. Uh, that encompasses all three parts of the the relationships of the. The three categories that we just discussed. Excellent. Now, this is very important. Um, some employers love to misclassify their employees when they're supposed to be W two employees. Sometimes you hear that they they issue out a ten, what is called a ten ninety nine form, which report uh, excuse me, a ten ninety nine NEC non employee compensation which is listed on block, which is listed i believe on block seven on the 1099 nec now employers are comp they do that some not all of them but some of them do that to avoid paying what's called self-employed payroll taxes what that means is that the employer if you're a w-2 employee there is the employer is responsible for one half of the Social Security and Medicare taxes, and the employee is withheld for the other. 
when you misclassified a worker as an independent contractor that has the set time control behavior control and financial control over the employee that, that misclassification can be uh, damaging to the employee as well as to the employer because now if it gets wind to the IRS and the audit, and an auditor comes in and looks at all the payroll records and wonder and has, starts to ask questions of why certain employer employees are paid as independent contractors as opposed to being a, a full time employee employee. What they're going to do is that they're going to rework, reclassify those employees. Uh, those contract from independent contractor to full time employees, and the the employer is going to be responsible for paying making up the payroll taxes that they were supposed to pay to the IRS. So it's very important to find to understand the the relationship between an independent contractor as well as an employee. Next slide. All right, so we're almost at the end of my presentation. Uh, pretty much the tax deadline is coming up really, really soon. And it's usually, it's gonna be on Tuesday, April 18th of this year, since April 15th is a Saturday. And the next weekday is April 17th and it's recognized as a holiday in Washington, DC. That's, so that's why the tax deadline is on April 18th. Now, if you can't, if you unable to follow your return by the deadline, you have you can follow what's called an extension for both. But you have it's very important that you have to follow an extension for both the federal side as well as the states. So that way, you'll have plenty of time to file your return by April, October sixteenth of twenty twenty three. Now, keep in mind, following the extension does only extends the time to file the return, not to pay. So that's why it's very important for all you business owners to come in, come in, talk to me. I'll consult you on if you need more time to file your return. We can do an estimate for you. And all you have to do is just pay at least 90% of the tax that the estimated tax that's due. So when you're ready to file your return on October 16th, you may get a little bit something back if it's overreported, but if it's underreported, you would just have to make up the difference. So I just want, I believe that's the end of my presentation. And I want to thank everybody for your time. And if you need any volunteer assistance, just, you know, we, we it's on our website, just go ahead and give us a call or shoot us or, or come by to one of our offices. I'm in the downtown hub, um, Monday, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. So you can just come by if you want to talk about your business taxes, you know, for free. You know, just make sure you schedule an appointment. But if you want to just come on by, that's fine. I'll be able to, I'm available to talk, to speak with all y'all. And I want to thank y'all. I want y'all to have a good day. Ariana? Sorry, Danny. If you could also just cover um, a bit about the tax prep, like the VITA side also. Um, oh, yeah, helpful. sure, 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 sure. I, I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, Yes, if you're not, our program is not limited to the self, I'm not limited to the self-employment tax program. I'm also assisting with the volunteer assist, the volunteer income tax assistance program, which I've been involved with since the last five years. So what it is, is that we, we service the community by filing returns for the low income individuals. So that way, we also provide the same services in individual planning, tax planning, and tax advisory services for, for the underserved. Um, what we do, we, we have our volunteers that are on staff are amazing. So, and, and, and the feedback from the community has been very positive. So we, we give advice to our clients to asset building, opening up bank accounts, uh, contributing to an IRA account, which is an individual retirement account, uh, college savings, like we provide information for college savings for your children, for, such as a 520 state, New York state 529 
accounts. And uh, our service is very vital to, to the community because it avoids some of the, or it, some of the poor that go out, go to these uh, predatory tax preparation offices. So, well, and I'm not gonna name any names tonight, but you know who they are. And uh, once again, yeah, if you want any more information, just stop by the website, go on the website, schedule an appointment, or just stop by one of our offices, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And I want to pass the mic back to Ariane. Thank, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Danny, for that presentation. And now we're going to pass it over to Kelly to talk about the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Thank you, Ariana. Uh, so I will be talking about the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. So as the name suggests, there are 10 fundamental rights that taxpayer have when dealing with the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, next slide, please. So first and foremost, taxpayers have the right to be informed, meaning they have the right to know what they need to do to comply with tax laws. You are entitled to clear explanations and procedures in all forms and publications that you receive from the IRS. And certain notices, they have to include the tax and interest and penalties that you owe, and it has to explain why you owe these amounts. And when the IRS disallows some of the refund, it also has to explain why your refunds were disallowed. And if you receive any notices, of proposed tax. The notice itself must also state how you can, uh, the procedures of these examinations through collection, and it should also explain the different options and services available, such as the taxpayer advocate service or a low-income taxpayer clinic, such as ours at BKA. And another example is if you have an installment payment plan the IRS is required to send you an annual statement so that you know the exact balances and the payments that are still owed. The second is the right to quality service. And this is especially applicable when you're speaking to the IRS on the phone. So taxpayers have the right to receive prompt, courteous and professional assistance from the IRS. And if you are on the phone, you're not receiving that, you can ask to speak to a supervisor and when you speak to the IRS, just make sure you write down the agent's name and ID. The ID usually starts with 100 or 1000. Write that down in case you feel that you are not being treated properly. And if you feel that your, your case wasn't handled with care, you can report it to the US Treasury Inspection General. And I listed the website here where you can report any interactions you've had had with the IRS. The IRS should not be contacting you outside of the 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. timeframe or be contacting your place of employment if your employee does not allow such contacts. Also be mindful of tax scams. The first and foremost contact the IRS will have with you is usually through mail. If you receive a phone call without any prior appointments, it's most likely a scam and just be aware of those and be mindful if you're receiving a phone call. And for the quality service, again, you can also contact the Taxpayer Advocate Service. It is an independent office within the IRS that's specifically set up to help taxpayers working with the IRS. The third bill of right is you have the right to pay no more than the correct amount of taxes that are owed meaning if you receive a bill and a notice and you believe there's an error on it, make sure you contact the IRS within the timeframe listed. Also provide photocopies of any records that may help correct that error. And because the IRS is still operating on an old system only through fax and mail, just make sure you scan and make a photocopy of any notices that you have and any of the documents you'll be submitting back. If you disagree with the notice sent by the IRS, you generally have 60 days to respond to the IRS submitting any documents. Usually the address is listed on the notice itself as well, you'll be sending all your documents. The IRS can, or you can also request any 
interest if it has been caused by an IRS delay. This is especially important during COVID as the IRS has really slowed down its service. It has automatically removed some of the penalties and interest, but if you find that there's still interest and penalties that should not apply to you, definitely contact the IRS and request the interest or penalty removal if it's due to an IRS delay. The fourth one is you do have the right to challenge the IRS's position and be heard. You have the right to raise any objections and provide any additional documents to prove that your position is correct. So again, if you receive a math error or clerical error from the IRS and you believe the IRS is wrong, respond within 60 days telling the IRS that you disagree. And if the IRS doesn't agree with your position, it will then send a notice of adjustment. And this, from this letter, you do have 90 days to file a petition with the U.S. tax court or 150 days if the notice was sent outside of the U.S. And when the IRS notifies you the plan to levy your bank account, you still have the opportunity to request a hearing with the Office of Appeals. And this ties to the next right, the right to appeal an IRS decision in an independent forum. So the IRS has an independent office, the IRS Office of Appeals. It reviews your documents and it should be separate from the initial office that has reviewed all your documents. And the appeals should not be discussing your case if it compromises its independence. And if you, your refund has been denied uh, and the IRS takes no action within six months, you can still file a refund suit with the U.S. District Court or the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. So, but generally, you only have two years to file your refund claim from the date the IRS mails you that notice. So again, keep track of all notices. Keep Be mindful of dates. Next slide, please. And here's just a graph of the appeals process uh, and that the IRS goes through. You do have multiple chances. So starting from the first notice, uh, make sure you keep a copy of that and to watch out for any dates on that notice. Next slide, please. And the last five set of your taxpayer bill of rights, the sixth one is the right to finality. So the IRS generally has three years from the date you file your tax return to assess any additional taxes. This is an exception. If they have reason to believe there's fraud involved, then the time frame gets extended. And the statute of limitations with the IRS for collecting unpaid taxes from you is generally 10 years, and that's from the date of assessment. So for this year, for example, 418 is the deadline for 2022, and assuming you filed on time, uh, you have until 2033 of April for the IRS to collect your tax debt. After that, the IRS legally cannot collect from you, so, but it is 10 years from the date of the assessment. If for some reason you filed late or the IRS assessed it later, then it starts from that late, whichever date is later. The IRS can suspend this time frame if you're in bankruptcy or any collection due process proceeding. For refunds, if you believe you overpaid your taxes, you have to file a refund claim within three years of the date of your original return or two years from the date you paid your taxes, whichever is later. So the time frame to claim refund is a lot shorter, usually about three years. The time frame for the IRS to collect tax from you is 10 years. So they're not the same, just be mindful of that. For audits, the IRS can assess your tax return usually once within a tax year, but they can reopen it if they find that there's reason of fraud or any uh, nefarious activities going on. The seventh is you do have the right to privacy. So in general, the IRS cannot uh, disclose your information to anyone outside of the, the parties unless authorized by you. And there are limits on the amount that the IRS can levy. So the protected amount usually is the equivalent of the standard deduction plus any deductions for personal exemptions. 
The IRS also cannot seize personal items or seize any your primary home without a court approval. And it also has to show that there's no reasonable alternative way before they even get to reach into your home or your property. And the IRS also cannot be asking any intrusive questions or extraneous information about your lifestyle during an audit. This is protected. And if you find that the IRS is asking these questions, make sure to tell them that this is against the Bill of Rights and you should not be doing so. The eighth is the right to confidentiality. So the IRS has to make sure it keeps the confidential information. And if you aren't working with an attorney, but with a an CPA or enrolled agent, similar rules should apply and you should expect your information to be protected and not disclosed unless authorized by you. The next one is to the right to retain representation. So if you are a low income taxpayer, you can contact the low income taxpayer clinic. We're usually, we, we are a nonprofit. We do not uh, charge ta taxpayers and you can retain an attorney, CPA enrolled agent through that. And if you have an interview with the IRS, the IRS has to suspend the interview if you are waiting to find a representation. And if you do have a representation, just make sure you have the power of attorney form signed so that they can represent you in front of the IRS and speak on your behalf. And then last but not least, the right to a fair and just tax system. So you have the right to expect the tax system to consider all the facts and circumstances that might affect your liability, ability to pay or provide information promptly. If you believe that you can't pay your taxes in full and you meet certain conditions, you can set up a payment plan over time or you can do an offer and compromise if you believe that you do not owe all of your taxes, you're unable to pay the full amount under a certain time frame, or this will cause a financial hardship for you. And the IRS should consider everything and all of the circumstances that you have. Next slide, please. So those are all of the Bill of Rights. So make sure if you find that the IRS is violating any of those rights that you flag it and to notify them that you have rights and the IRS should not be violating them. So here are some of the best practices to do if you do receive an IRS notice. First and foremost, do not ignore it. Most of the time it's just about your tax return or just give you an update. Make sure to always keep a copy and do not panic. The notice itself should list the dates of when you need to respond by, how you should respond, what phone number to call. And if there are any adjustments, make sure you compare it to the original return. If you do not agree, uh, you can always write back within 60 days saying why you don't agree and provide any statements or notices or letters back to the IRS. Make sure you do respond in a timely matter and keep a copy of the notice. The IRS, again, is not very good at using a more modern technology. Everything's still by fax and paper. So in case your mail gets lost, just make sure you keep a copy of every single document that you do send. Usually there's no need to call the IRS. The first thing the IRS does is send things by mail. If for whatever reason you get a random phone call, I've had a client who received a phone call recently, the phone call number was only off by one digit, but when I called back, I knew immediately it was a scam. And just make sure that you're aware there are a lot of scammers out there and just be mindful of that. The IRS will never contact you using social media or text. The first point of contact is always through mail. And next slide, please. And here I just list a few different sites within uh, the city that you can look up volunteer income tax assistance sites. These provide free services to prepare tax returns. And if you need to look up your own account, here's a link for the IRS online account. And if you have not received your stimulus checks, you can call the IRS at the number listed here or file the form 3911 to still claim those. Next slide. I think that concludes my part of the presentation.
Yeah, thank you so much, Kelly. That was extremely informative. And actually, on that note, we're going to go a little bit off script here um, because I know some people typically, not typically, but just some people don't like to stay for the Q&A or they don't have time to. But I have a question that I think um, getting an answer might be helpful and beneficial to everybody on the call. So I actually have a question about the Taxpayer Bill of Rights that you were just talking about. And you mentioned that if you feel like your rights have been violated, then you should contact the IRS. Do you recommend um, meeting with an attorney like people at um, BK Legal to help you write that letter? Or what should the letter state? Like, What should people know about if their rights have been violated, then what specifically should they do first? Like, What's the first step? Yeah, I would definitely recommend uh, writing a complaint to the U.S. Inspection General. There's a link that I posted, and I will share that as well in the chat. And with the letter, you can write it yourself, but you can, if you don't feel comfortable, you can definitely contact a low-income taxpayer clinic, such as ours at BK or any other clinics in the city, to assist you with writing that letter. Great, thank you so much. Um, so, like I said, some people typically don't like to stay for the Q&A, so I do wanna give those folks an opportunity, if you would like, um, to take a screenshot or take a picture. This is the contact info for both BKA and for Grow Brooklyn. Um, BKA has two sites that you can visit. Um, they also have their email up here, their phone number and their website. There's a lot more information on the website. If you would like to look into that and see if maybe any of the other services that they provide are beneficial to you or this service in particular, the LIC, uh, LITC service that they provide. For Grow Brooklyn, our contact info is over here in the green. Um, we have our email address up there. You can shoot us an email. We, if you have a question, if you would like to schedule an appointment, we have our phone number up there. You can also make an appointment. Our website, you can make an appointment on there. Um, and this is our main location, but we do not accept walk-ins at this location. Um, just a public service announcement on that. We're going to hop back to the Q&A now. So just a quick last second, if anybody would like to take a screenshot or a picture. Three, two, one. We're moving back. Okay. Um, so I did see a question in the chat, and I believe that this is probably directed towards Danny. Um, Martha asks, if you're classified as a contractor, are you entitled to insurance benefits? I'm sorry. Are you entitled to insurance if you're in if you're hired as a contractor as an independent contractor? Yeah. No. Uh, uh, typically, well, it depends on it, it depends on the contract, the contractee, the, the relationship between the contractee. But typically, no. You are responsible for your own health insurance benefits. And Martha, if you'd like to expand upon that question, um, feel free to type it in the Q and A or in the chat, uh, whichever is easiest for you. We did have another question that Danny answered in the chat, but just in case people wanted to hear it out loud, um, somebody asked, you mentioned self-employment. What about someone who just started a business? Can you help with taxes? Absolutely, we can, we can assist you on tax plan, planning and consultation on, uh, I'm sorry, we can assist on the consultation of tax planning for us. So for anyone that's thinking about starting their own, uh, starting their own business or becoming self -employed. So we can actually assist on that aspect. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank oh, you, Kelly, for your answer earlier. And then thank you, Danny, for your answers to these questions now. And thank you both for um, centering the community and allowing them to ask you your question, their questions and get your insights and your answers uh, based on your experience. We really appreciate it. Um, as we do, as we do our kind of our wrap up and coming to a close with things, um, feel free to continue to drop your questions in the chat if you're typing them right now. Um, I'm just going to go through a little closings, and then if I don't see any more questions, then I will be ending the Zoom. Um, but yeah, it looks like we've made it to the end of our three-part series. This has been three weeks of our tax attorneys and our uh, experienced tax professionals. Yes, round of applause, round of applause, everybody. Um, we had Tamara from BK Legal. At part one, we had Michaela Brathwaite at part one from Go Brooklyn. Uh, amazing presentations. If you missed them, I'm so sorry you missed them, but I'm very, very happy that you'll be able to watch them on BK Legal's YouTube page. Uh, at part two, we have Rajan from Go Brooklyn, who's on the call here. 
and Charles Healy from BK Legal. Again, amazing presentations, a lot of really helpful information. Um, and tonight, obviously, we have Kelly and Danny, and this is incredibly insightful, really important information. I do see something popped up in the chat. Um, which number is Danny? So the contact info that's up here is just the general um, Go Brooklyn like tax contact info. Um, Danny, if you would like to elaborate in the chat, um, providing her with more direct contact, if you're comfortable with that, uh, then feel free. But yeah, if you call this number, uh, then you'd kind of be, you know, worked, worked around through um, like getting connected to the right person. Um, but yeah, so I want to thank our presenters. As always, it was amazing. It was so insightful and a lot of important information that a lot of people don't know about and don't particularly know where to get that information from. So the fact that this was kind of a one-stop shop, you know, spread out across three weeks, um, we're really happy that we were able to offer this to everybody. And we're very, very appreciative of all of you for joining us. Um, I also want to thank the entire team at BK Legal, their development team, who has been so, so helpful. Um, anyone else there who helped put together the content for these slides. I know our team, like our Go Brooklyn team, I'm very, very appreciative of all of them for their work for putting together the content for these slides to provide for you. Sorry, I'm just going back to the chat. No problem, Phoebe. <laughs> um, I also do want to take a moment to acknowledge again, our elected officials who so graciously joined us. Uh, we had New York State Senator Roxanne Persaud, we had Council Member Crystal Hudson, and tonight, we had Assemblywoman, New York State Assemblywoman, Sarah Sue Front Forest, who had to log off, but again, we really appreciate her. Sorry, I'm toggling back to the chat and the Q&A. Uh, someone said thanks for the information. No problem at all, it was our pleasure. Um, it looks like Danny might have gotten kicked off of the Zoom, um, but somebody asked a question. I started as a reseller online, and I'm not sure if or how many or if or how I'm supposed to file. I saw that for resellers, it was $20 in profit. I think the commas might be in the wrong place. Um, so what I will say, since you know technical difficulties, they happen, I will say that you can take this question and if you email, let me go back. If you email this email here, free taxes at Go Brooklyn, um, we'll be able to connect you with somebody who can answer that question. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry we're not able to answer it right now technology, it happens. Um, but yes, please feel free to use that email and send this question and we will have somebody get back to you and provide you with the information that you need. Um, but yeah, I just wanna double check the chat and make sure we're not skipping over anybody, double check the Q&A. Yeah, so again, running back to thanking our elected officials, always appreciate them showing up for the community and showing their support. Um, if you need any of their contact info, then if you just type in their names in Google, you'd be able to, all of their web pages show up, their official web pages from the New York State Senate, the New York State Assembly, and New York City Council. And they'll be able to connect you with a plethora of different resources and help you with anything that you might need. Um, but yeah, I thank everyone for joining us. I especially thank all of you, the participants, and our community members who showed up and allowed us to enter this space sharing this knowledge with you. Oh, it looks like Danny was able to get back on. Give me one second. Whoever asked that question, please don't log off. Um, give him a second to connect his audio. Hi, Danny. Um, we have a question that came up for you. Somebody asked, I'm assuming the dollar amounts are that where the commas are might be a bit incorrect. If you'd like, you can view the Q&A question yourself by clicking on the Q&A function. Oh, sure. But somebody had a question about being a reseller um, and their taxes. I wanted to know if you'd be able to answer that while we have them on the call. Oh, sure. Uh, sorry about that. My internet went out. Um, a, yeah. <laughs> All right. I didn't see the question in the chat. Hold on. It's Ooh. in the Q&A function. Um, Q &A function. So, yeah. All right. Uh, hold on. It's right next to the chat button. Um, oh, here, we here we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Answer. Oh my God, it doesn't. All right, what's the question again? <laughs> so she, uh, they stated, I started as a reseller online and I'm not sure if or how I'm supposed to file. Um, I saw that for resellers, it was, they have it here $20. Um, 
yeah, twenty dollars in profit, but I'm closer to ten. So what do I need to do? I'm not sure if those dollar amounts are correct, but essentially their question is just about being a reseller. Right. Yeah, if, if you're a reseller and that amount on the federal side, you may uh, is that the only one that they have? I just wanted to find out is that the only income that they have, or is that some typo? Oh, 20,000. 20,000. Yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah, you would have to file a return. And if you are a reseller, and if you are registered with the state, and this is where we can help you, is sales tax issues. Because I have some experience with dealing with sell, uh, clients that have issues with sales tax. Issues. I used to work for the New York State Tax and Finance Department. So I was one of those guys that would just walk, that would walk around knocking on doors saying, hey, you have, you have some you have some outstanding tax debt, sales tax that's due. So you want to make sure that you, if you have registered with it, with the state and received a certificate of authorization, you should be filing your sales tax returns as well as part of that income. If you are a reseller in, in New York, if most of the goods and services, if you ship within New York State, you should be collecting sales tax. But outside of New York State, there is no requirement unless it's over $100,000 in sales, which I doubt that you have, but only for New York State. But typically with $20,000 in income that you receive, yes, that's gonna be subject to federal, state, and local taxes as well, as self-employment taxes. Great, thank you so much for answering that. We're so glad you were able to hop back on. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. So yeah, if you have, if you would like to, Danny mentioned earlier, consultations, if you'd like to meet with him to discuss further, or if you'd like to set up an appointment, or even, again, if you would just like to send the email and elaborate on your question and get more details, um, then feel free to use that email address that's up there. And the same for BKA, if you have any kind of, you know, IRS kind of tax issues or any of their other programs, their amazing programs, actually, um, then feel free to use that contact info as well. But yeah, thank you all for sticking it out with us over three weeks. Thank you for your support. We appreciate you. We value you. We see you. Um, and thank you so much. Yeah. So if you're traveling home, travel safely. Hope you're able to enjoy the beautiful weather today. Um, not so beautiful looking, but it was beautiful feeling. Um, so thank you, everyone. We really appreciate you. And we hope you all have a great rest of your night. Bye, guys. All right. Enjoy.